Yep. Starting stream. <laughs> Groundskeeper Willie, you are live, you are live. A very good Saturday morning to you all. We are live from underwater at a very special location called Fish Reef. So it's Lauren here, all the way from Bonnie, Scotland. We have Hungarian Emil on the camera, and we have Ozzy Patrish on the surface. Now, today is exciting for so many reasons. We're at a new location called Fish Reef, also called La Mesa in Spanish, which means tabletop because it looks like a tabletop. So we're gonna explore this new site and who knows what we're gonna see. But also, today is national, or international should I say, Shark Awareness Day, one of my favorite days. It's time to celebrate sharks. And there is a chance today we might even see a nerf shark called Finn. We never know, so we're gonna keep our eyes open for Finn. Today is a day to celebrate these animals. So, throughout the dive, Pat and I are gonna tell you lots of information about sharks because sharks are fish and we are at Fish Reef. <laughs> so these animals are to be revered, not feared. So please, if you have any questions about sharks today, even if we're not exactly seeing them, feel free to go ahead and ask and we will answer them. So I'm going to head it over to my boy Pat and both Emil and I are going to swim around this beautiful fishy reef. Welcome everybody and a massive hello. So today, as Lauren said, is Shark Awareness Day. So we're really, really hoping that Finn does drop on by and say hello this morning. So Lauren, what depth are you at right now? Very good question. So I am at 11 meters. And right in front of me, we have a really active school of Creole wrasse. Now we do mention these fish a lot. Oh, they're being cleaned. But rarely do we actually get to see them so close. They're really beautiful fish. They might appear really blue on the camera, but they're actually more colorful. They have splashes of yellow and white on them. They are being cleaned by a little yellow and purple guy. Are you able to see this, Pat? Yeah, yeah, I can. So this little yellow fish is a Spanish hogfish, and it is a little cleaner fish. They tend to do this in their juvenile face. I have never seen one so small. <laughs> They are quite cute. So a lot of fish species will actually become cleaner fish in their juvenile phase and then move on to a more advanced diet as they get older. Yeah, clean it. The being a cleaner in your juvenile phase, like this little Spanish hoggy, is the perfect way to survive and thrive. Oh, we're getting photobombed by a big mud and snapper here. Hello. Oh, these guys are just the most curious fish, I would say, that we have here. This one's really big, and I think he's coming to check us out to make sure we don't have any squids or lionfish in our pockets, which I can assure you we don't. <laughs> so yeah, back to the cleaners. It is the perfect way to avoid being eaten. It's the safest thing you can do. Not only do you get, ooh, not only do you get a free meal, you get the chance to just eat all the exoparasites off the fish, the fish won't eat you. So ultimately, you are protected. So it's a great thing to be, and as Pat mentioned, this was the Spanish hogfish, but many fish do this, including angelfish. And we have an absolutely huge school ahead. We have schoolmasters and another snapper. Have you got the snapper guide there, Pat? Yeah, I'm just about to get the ID book out because I don't believe we've seen these ones before. Yeah, it's a mixture. It's all snappers. We have schoolmaster snappers. We have blue-lined grunts. 
I think we have some French grunts and then the big silver one, I'm not 100% sure. All right, so I'm on the snappers now. Let me see what I can find here. So they're very obviously a snapper by their body shape. From where I am, they're completely silver in color with a really dark teal. I am going to be honest with you all. I'm very good at IDing fish. But I think my worst fish to ID are snappers and groupers. <laughs> now, are these the fish with the, the snappers that we're trying to identify? Would you say that they have... Uh, oh, no, don't worry. No, it's, I was going to ask if that's red there, but it's definitely black. Yeah, it's I not think, the red yeah, snapper for sure. Not it's not mahogany. Um, I think it may be a sailor's choice. It's a very, um, how would you describe it, standard looking fish, <laughs> if you know what I mean. If I was to draw a fish for someone, it would probably end up looking like this. It's very nondescript. Yes, he's a very fishy fish, this one. Uh, <laughs> so, I believe that these ones are the sailor's choice. Is that a new one then, It definitely is one, and they are actually a grunt. So grunt and snappers are essentially the same, but yeah, sailor's choice. Oh, awesome. Yeah, grunts and snappers are, are pretty much the, the same thing. And uh, they get their name grunts because if you were to fish this animal and take it out of the water, they make a really deep grunting sound, which also snappers do as well. So that's where the name comes from. But this school is huge. It's lovely to be swimming among schools, and apparently there is a lot of big schools of fish on this reef. And obviously that's where it gets its name, Fish Reef, from. So I do feel like it's going to be a fishy dive, but I have got my hope to see fin, the nurse shark, but also some turtles. It's very early in the morning here in Grand Cayman. So normally this is a perfect time to catch sight of a turtle who's just kind of wakening up and looking for breakfast. Yeah, that would be great if we could get a turtle, but seeing as it is Shark Awareness Day and rays are very closely related to sharks, I'm also requesting a ray of some sort. Okay, you hear that, Emil? We've got a lot of things to find. <laughs> And also, I just wanted to say a very big happy birthday to Linda Polly, who is a, a very avid Dive Live fan and has been supporting us from the start. So happy birthday, Linda. Oh, happy birthday, Linda. I hope you have a fabulous day. So I think we have a spotty drum up ahead, a juvenile. We do, and what a gorgeous fish this is. So mesmerizing to watch. I often say that they remind me of a gymnast with the ribbons, those uh, in the Olympics. Yeah, and when they're a juvenile, they just tend to swim in these, like Pat mentioned, mesmerizing circles. They just go round and round and round and round because they are hiding out in the sort of safety and the comfort zone of a crevice or an overhang. So they are nocturnal animals, so therefore during the day they are literally hiding out. We have a huge school of Pat's favourite fish, <laughs> I believe could be the Bermuda chub. Yeah, I think these ones are the brassy chubs because of the horizontal lines there, but they are very hard to distinguish between the two. Oh wow, they're coming really close to me. <laughs> Hi guys. And, and Lauren uh, was, was lying there. They are not my favourite fish. They are about the plainest fish in the world. There's not much going on with these guys. Yeah, I was only teasing Pat. We have our favourite fish and some that are not quite our favourites. So there's actually two spotted drums down there now. This is oh, wow. good. It's worth very, very rare to see one. So to see two is amazing. Yeah, that's quite unusual because they're normally quite solitary. So this is definitely going to be a fishy dive. So we, me and Pat both play a game, as some of you may know, what's that fish? So we're desperately trying to expand our fish database 
and add in as many species that we see during the dive. So I will, we've already spotted one, but I will be on the lookout for more since we are at Fish Reef. So please do send in your questions about relevant about what we're seeing, but also anything you would like to know about sharks. We're more than happy to answer them today if we can. And Emil, we're just going to head on and swim over this beautiful fishy reef. And we do have a question here from Misha, and she just wants to know whereabouts uh, off Grand Cayman we are diving. Okay, so we are diving with Don Foster's, but today we have gone on the boat, a lovely boat from Don Foster's, and we are diving towards the north side along a very famous area of Grand Cayman called Seven Mile Beach. And this site itself is called Fish so that is where we're diving today something a little bit different for you all and we can definitely see where this reef gets its name from there is a quite a good diversity of fish down here today yeah, there's just an incredible amount of fish everywhere there's another big school up ahead it's most likely snappers again but we will try and get you close to that school and just to clarify for both Spess and Misha that was a spotted drum that black and white fish that we saw yeah but the one thing about the spotted drums is that they look so different in their adult phase and it's a little bit <laughs> awkward to say but as they become an adult they're nowhere near as attractive they're absolutely beautiful juveniles they're glorious to watch but as they become an adult they're nowhere near as good looking uh, um, Pat are you able to just check our line we're not able to move <laughs> yeah yeah sure uh, so we'll ask Rian sure I'll keep blabbling away while we're talking about that. So this reef is known as Table Cop, and it is literally a big outcrop of coral coming up from the sand, and it just spreads out like a big tabletop. So if you like, we at the minute are on the top of the tabletop, and we're just going to look around as much as we can. I'm still only at eight meters, and the shallower we stay, the longer the dives can be. So we're going to go round the meal once we can get moving. Is everything okay, Pat? Yeah, uh, so we're just going to get it unhooked now. So okay. it is. Um, so Rian's just doing that. So I'll give you the all clear when it's good to move again. But Perfect. in the oh. meantime, we do have some shark questions here. Okay, let's get sharky. <laughs> <laughs> so Proud Cat Mama wants to know, do nurse sharks have predators? Um, actually, that's a really good question. Here in Grand Cayman, I'm really not sure about that, but generally, all over the world, the biggest predators of sharks are other larger sharks and orcas. So they do say that sharks are the apex predators of the ocean, and they are one of them, yes, but we also must remember the orcas. They are also a huge apex predator of the ocean. But here in Grand Cayman, I'm not sure. What would you say, Pat? Hmm, yeah, I don't think the adults would really be preyed on too much, but perhaps the juveniles might get taken by an odd hammerhead shark or maybe a really big grouper. Uh, juveniles, yes, juveniles yeah. would be preyed upon, but adult nurse sharks here, yeah. I think they're pretty safe. And that's why they get to sleep away most of the days and just be lazy. Any other sharky questions, Pat? Um, not as of yet, but please keep them coming in, guys. So if you are on Twitter, use the hashtag Dive Live. And we will try our best to answer them. Well, actually, we do have one here from P. Hart asking, yep. 
Is it true that sharks need to move 24 hours a day all the time? Um, most sharks, yes, not all of them, but generally most sharks do need to keep swimming all the time, especially the large predatory ones. So they always keep to, need to keep swimming, same with mantas, but there are some sharks that are able to rest on the bottom, the nurse shark being one of them. So sharks do not have a swim bladder. We regularly talk about that regarding fish, but sharks do not have that. They do have big, large livers full of oil, and that is what they use to help control their buoyancy. So most sharks do have to keep swimming. And take care, no, the line is coming up to the boat, so we don't have to have it all the way back to land when we're on the boat. little bit different for us so the we are attached to a very long line which is why we have to sometimes check on it and the line is just going back up to the port and big techs would like to know on these stingrays so there has been sightings of hammerheads but most of the sightings are from very 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 early in the morning so you would have to be lucky to see a hammerhead i think have you ever seen one, Pat? <laughs> no, I haven't, unfortunately. That would be amazing. Uh, yeah, and I mean, there has been s sightings here in Grand Cayman, so all we can do is cross our fingers. So we're just having a look a little bit deeper in this reef for you before we go shallower, just to see if we can find anything interesting. So we have question here from King Quad and it says are all female sharks born pregnant? Um, I don't believe so. I have never heard of that. Have you, Pat? No, no, I haven't. Maybe uh, you're getting confused with the fact that some sharks can get pregnant as soon after they give birth, like immediately on this thing called conveyor belt babies where they have a baby coming through constantly but no i don't believe they are born pregnant yeah they're the sharks group is a really sort of broad and diverse group of fish there are well over 450 different species of sharks now and they inhabit all different types of ecosystems within the ocean and you, they range from very small sharks such as the dwarf lantern shark that can actually fit in the size of your palm. I've got relatively small hands and they can fit in my palm to the great size of the whale shark, which is around 15 meters by 50 feet. So they range in size, but they also range in their diverse range of diets. So they all have different mouth structures and different teeth. So for example, the great white shark will have really pointy, jaggy teeth for gripping and tearing apart their prey. But then you get the filter feeders who just open their mouths and suck in all of the plankton. They don't really need teeth. And then you get ones like the nurse shark, which have sort of plates that work like a mortar and pester and they grind all the hard shell prey and mollusks. So there's such a diverse range of sharks, they also have such a range of reproduction methods. They're not all the same. There is scientific evidence that suggests some sharks, not all, can actually um, fertilize themselves, become pregnant without a male. <laughs> So that is definitely phenomenal work and this little mud and snapper has been following us the whole time. We just thought we'd give him some attention. So yes, I don't believe sharks are born pregnant. I've never heard that before, but if you do have any other information, do share it with us. But well, yes, there's such a huge range of different reproductive methods. Well, he did uh, follow up by saying that hammerhead sharks are born pregnant, but it's actually not that. It's what Lauren just said. So they're not born pregnant, but they can get pregnant without a male. Yeah, there's lots of scientific evidence looking into that now, actually, that sharks are able to become pregnant without a male, which is incredible. 
It's not something that we as humans are too familiar with. So I don't believe they've sort of researched it enough, but yeah, I was reading up on that the other night, so great point. So we're just looking under some of the ledges here. There's lots of ledges, because these really are the perfect places where a turtle would rest during the night and sleep, if you like. So we're just going to check all of these areas, because you never know. And yes, Betty, I am up on the boat today. I am not on the dock. I am here up on the boat. <laughs> yes. And I'm glad he's there. What would I do without Pat? <laughs> I think it works both ways there, Lauren. <laughs> this is a really lovely... <laughs> I seriously think this mud and snapper thinks he keeps on coming up to my hands. I don't have anything. <laughs> so yes, just some background on the mud and snapper story. A lot of people do spear lionfish here and they'll keep them in a bucket. It's legal, it's permitted, it's controlled. And I think some mutton snappers do learn behaviour. Fish are smarter than you think. Have sort of able to come up and maybe steal some lionfish out of people's buckets. So I believe this guy, who won't really leave me alone, <laughs> thinks I have lionfish. So... That's why he keeps coming up and looking at my hands. And we have a question here from Suzanne. She's asking, what are all the little bright blue fish that are swimming around? Okay, there is quite a few different ones, but up ahead here we do have blue chromis. So we showed you the Creole wrasse earlier, but these ones, the Hope and Meal can sort of get you close, are very small blue chromis. So there's lots and lots of blue fish, but I think that might be the ones that you are referring to. Are you able to see them? Yeah, we're getting a good shot of that now, these little blue chromas. And we can tell that they're blue chromas by the deeply forked tail. You can see it's almost a perfect V-shape. Yeah, they're not the easiest things, as they never stay still. <laughs> They are quite pretty when you observe them up close. We, I don't think we've ever actually had one with the zoom before, and Emil's doing a really good shot, of, a really good job of capturing this. Yeah, they're very, very beautiful fish. Bright blue, very striking. And from a distance, the Creole wrasse and the blue chromis look very similar. From a distance. So we've kind of done a full circle of this lovely fish reef, so we are going to go into the centre of it. Wow, this blue chromis is being cleaned right now by a goby. I've never seen such a small oh, fish really? be cleaned I'm before. Not that close. I can't yeah, see that. this is cool. Wow. So even the small fish have to get cleaned by even smaller fish. And uh, off they go. That was awesome. What a great little sighting. Lots of spotty drum juveniles here. We didn't see one for long enough when we first came here. And now we see them all the time. And um, I know you couldn't see that exact blue chromis, but Betty was asking how big it was, so maybe you can just tell us how, how big they usually are when we oh, see no, them. I saw, the, I saw the blue chromis, oh, okay. I just didn't see the goby. Yeah. So I would say it was about um, three to four centimetres. So, an inch, is that right? Yeah, just a little bit over, just a bit under two inches, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was very small. So we're seeing more grunts as we come through here, and the little purple and yellow fish to the right are royal grammars or a fairy basslet. Oh, and it looks like we have a Christmas tree worm as well. Oh yeah, we have. We've got everything here. So this Christmas tree worm is obviously burrowed into the coral. 
that it's a yellow color but they do come in all sorts of different colors and it may look like there's one worm here but i can assure you it may look like there's two sorry but i can assure you it's just one emil can you show everyone the christmas tree worm yeah, so the worm, the animal, is actually living inside the coral. It's a type of segmented worm, and it lives in a little bunker inside. Now, many people think they sort of bury and board their way into the corals, but they actually don't. So there is separate sexes of these animals. There's males and females, and they do broadcast spawn, very similar to fish. They will just release their sperm and eggs into the water column. And the fertilized larvae will just nestle against the coral and sort of force the coral to grow over it. So they don't act actively burrow themselves into the coral. Now the appendages that you're looking at, the two crowns or the two Christmas trees, you can see where it gets its name from, they actually harness oxygen, so it acts as a sort of respiratory organ, and it's how they feed. So they can't move, they're completely stuck in this coral for life, but they are able to capture bits of food and plankton that pass through them in the water. So not only are they able to capture the food, but they're able to sort through it. So they're able to sort of say, hmm, no, I don't want that. Oh yeah, I'd like this. And the food that they do want, they sort of just pass to the mouth in a conveyor belt style. So that is what we're looking at ahead, a Christmas tree worm. That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, and uh, Spass wanted to know, can we tell whether it's a male or a female? That's a good question. Unfortunately not. A lot of animals do have separate sexes, but it's not possible for us with the naked eye to tell exactly whether it's male or female. But many people think that this is two worms. Oh, have they gone back inside? There we go. So they're actually able to hide in their bunker whenever they sense danger. They're able to sense light and sense shadows and movement. So if they feel something is coming too close, namely a predator, they are able to retract those crowns back into their little burrows. Not only that, they're able to cover the opening to their little bunkers with a special thing called an operculum which just covers that entrance and keeps them completely hidden and safe inside. Okay, so we're going to keep swimming up to the top of the reef. And yes, Vagos, we can see your comments, so if you have any questions, please ask them. Yep, keep your questions relevant to what we're seeing and, and what today's about, of sharks. And I'm sure between both Pat and I, we can pull our knowledge together and hopefully answer them for you. Well, we actually just have one more Christmas tree worm question from Ca sure. Proud Cat Mama. She wants to know, are they decomposers? Are they what, sorry? Decomposers. No, they're not. No, they're filter feeders. Yep, so they sift through the food that's passing by in the water column, namely plankton and things like that, and they pass it to their mouth. So they filter it out the water. They're not decomposers. So let's go and join this big school again. There's just loads of big schools of fish here which is not something we often see at Casarina Point. So we're going to go up ahead and join them. Wow, this is a huge school. <laughs> it really is. Gee whiz, they are thick. So it's snappers again. It's a lot of snappers. And what I've noticed is that in these big schools, these big aggregations of fish, you always get the odd bottles. If you look closely enough, there's a blue tang right in the middle, just trying to like casually disguise itself among the snappers. And it's really funny because to us we can see it, it's not doing a very good job. But obviously 
hip wheels protect feet within the scroll. And it's very stationary. They're not actually letting they're letting us get very close. They're not swimming away. And they're not doing anything. So most likely they're just hanging out together for safety in numbers. And my new boyfriend, the modern snapper's back <laughs> and he's jealous that we're giving attention to all the other fish. Hello? Now, Lauren, Love Dogs has been a great dive buddy and just checking up on your air there. Oh, she always does. Thank you, Love Dogs. I have 110 bar. Oh, great. Still plenty of dive time. So we now have a Spanish pugfish joining in. The mudden snappers just bombarded right through the school. And right in the middle, we have some blue tanks. I'm going to try and see if Emil can put them on the screen for you but they're trying very hard to pretend that they're snappers so we do cover this sometimes in our dives but it was something we actually learned to one of your questions when we were asked we didn't actually know so what is the difference between a school and a show well, there is a difference. They're not used interchangeably. So a shoal is basically when fish come together for a purpose. So it's a fish aggregation. Oh wow, what is this massive fish approaching? Oh wow, this guy's huge. Oh wow, that looks like another Kubera snapper, is it? Oh wow, yep, Kubera snapper. So can you give us a size estimate? Ooh, almost the size of half of me, you know, bigger. It's like Emil's trying to get you closer to the snap. I would say well over a meter. That is a big snapper. So we... <laughs> and he seems to be coming to check out the school of his fellow snappers. Hopefully we can get it close so we can just see in comparison to the other fish how big it actually is. Oh yeah, wow. Yeah, we can see that that's a big boy. We saw him coming in from the distance. So there's a lot of different snappers down here today. We can even see a red snapper there cruising off in the distance. Yeah, I don't think we've actually ever mentioned a red snapper on Dive Live. So this possibly could be another one for the list. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of snappers. <laughs> so as I was saying, I can't really remember what I was saying, <laughs> but I'll do my best. So a shoal is when fish come together for a purpose, namely a social reason. So it's an aggregation with a social context, whereas a school is just a random aggregation of fish. So that is the two differences between these words. And they do say that of all fish, a quarter of them, 25%, actually show for a huge, most of their life, almost all of their life, and a half, 50% of all fish will show at some point in their life. Yeah, that's great. And we actually have a really good question here about schooling from Take Care. He wants to know, is there a leader or a, a, yeah, a leader of this school? Great question. We haven't actually gone through this in quite some time as well. So believe it or not, there is. So schools or shows were not really understood for a long time because fish are so alien to us. It took a long time to understand how do these schools work? How are they controlled? How do all these fish know which direction to go in? How are they all staying so tightly together? Well, yes, there kind of is a leader, but this leader can change. It's more of a role. And it's normally the fish in the center of the school is able to control the whole school, able to provide sort of warnings, instructions, and direction. So I think Emil is getting such a great view of the school for you, but all fish have something called a lateral line. If we are able to sort of point it out to you, we will. And this is almost like an extra sense. So we can obviously touch, see, 
hear, smell, and taste, and so can fish. But they have an extra sense, something that's hard for us to understand. And it's a line that runs along the sides of their body from their head to their tail, known as the lateral line, which is filled with little pores. And these pores have special hairs, if you like, which can detect pressure changes in the water around them. And they use this sense within the school to take lead and take charge of the school itself. So I'm not sure how close you are to any of the fish pack, but are you able to see any lateral lines? Yeah, yeah, we definitely can. So on these ones with the black tails, the sailor's choice, if you look just behind the top of the operculum or the gill covering, you can see a line that runs all the way down its body there to its tail. So yeah, we're Wait, getting I'm good glad views. I'm you can see it so you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> now, Lauren, your mum here, I reckon she's out to stump you because I don't know the answer of this one. Oh no. <laughs> but Elaine wants to know, how is the leader actually chosen of the school? I was actually just thinking that as I was sort of given my explanation. I'm not entirely sure, but I'm guessing it's to do with the arrangement of the school. So somehow, within their, it looks a bit messy to me, but within their arrangement, because they're able to detect pressure changes, they must be aware of which one is in the centre. But honestly, I'm not 100% sure about that, so thanks, Mum. <laughs> I guess it's just, I could follow these fish all day, it's absolutely insane. But there are a lot of fish known to attach themselves to schools, and they're aware that they're doing it, and it can be really annoying for the fish in the school. So an example would be the trumpet fish. The trumpet fish is actually able to change its colours, to blend in with other fish and sometimes they do it to the blue tang and the blue tangs get very annoyed to find the trumpet fish sort of attached to them and they do their best to shake them off so there's been evidence that this whole school will charge at the bottom of the sea floor rub themselves against the sea floor and all dart off in opposite directions to try and get rid of the trumpet fish so hopefully these guys won't do that to us. Hopefully they don't want to get rid of us too easily. And uh, Spess was just asking about that big Cubera snapper before. He wanted to know what the average weight of one is. And I'm not sure of the average weight, but I know the biggest one ever caught was 57 kilograms or 125 pounds. So that is a big fish. <laughs> that is a very big fish. We saw it coming in from the deep and I almost thought it was a shark. It was so big. I wonder how many fish are here in this school. It's definitely over a hundred for sure. There is so many, yep. If I had to if I had to estimate, I would say two hundred at least. Minimum. We'll wow. Go with your figures. Look, I'm <laughs> terrible at that game. <laughs> So, uh, Liano just wanted us to clarify why some of these fish have a black tail and some have a yellow tail. Oh, that's because they're different species. So they are both in the grouping snappers, in the snapper family, but they're different species, so they have different colorations. So, the one with the yellow tail are the schoolmasters, and the other ones, what did you say they were, Pat? The sailor's choice. There you go. So those are maybe the sort of two that you can see, but there is actually also blue striped grunts and French grunts in there as well. And they're all part of the, the same grouping. So I can see where Fish Reef gets its name from. <laughs> There's a lot of fish. Yes, definitely. And Jin Lin's just saying on Twitter, using the hashtag Dive Live, that she thinks that school fish because uh, that makes them look like one large fish. And this is kind of right. It's, it, is, it is to throw predators off, but it's more to confuse them uh, by not knowing which way or direction to actually go or not being able to just single one out. So you are kind of right there. Safety in 
numbers and fish can really really confuse their predators by flapping about in the school and Emil if you can come over here just at the front of the school there's a fish that we've never pointed out on dive live before Ooh. oh it kind of is kind of getting photobombed by the school now but let's see if we can go on. i think it's a porgy but i'm not sure which species pat will be able to exactly tell you all right i'm just getting the id book out now a larger fish, it's silver. Hold on, let's see if it slows down. It's definitely a porgy, we can tell by the shape of its head. But which porgy? I'm not sure. And there's something about the word porgy I just like to say. <laughs> porgy, porgy, porgy. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get close to it. It seems to be on a mission. Yeah, uh, obviously I can't say for sure, but from what I can see, it looks like a jolt head porgy. But having said that, we are quite a bit away from it, so I can't confirm that. Yeah, it was very close. It has swam off. I'll keep my eye on it and hopefully whilst we sort of hover around and look at the other fish it might come back sorry about that so they do estimate that the global fish population is slowly reaching 34,000 so that's across the globe and all the different oceans and all the different climates so there's a lot of fish and obviously all the fish that we are seeing here today are tropical reef fish and the amazing thing is is there's so many of them and it's very difficult to learn them all as i'm sure most of you know a lot of them have different color phases so this is known as polychromatic so when they were juvenile they can be a completely different shape and color from when they're an adult so the blue tang and the spotty drum that we saw they are perfect examples now the blue tang is obviously called the blue tang because it's blue but actually when these guys are juveniles they're the exact same shape but they are bright yellow so we have a blue tang that happens to be bright yellow and it can almost be mistaken for a different fish and then when you get the spotty drum it's kind of the same colors but a completely different body shape when it's a juvenile and even when it's an adolescent and an adult it has three different forms so fish can be very com complex within themselves and there's such a wide range of them and in different regions of the world they have different names so all of these reasons make them a very complex topic to study and learn yeah there's just so many factors down here you could i think study your entire lifetime on probably just one species and still not know anything oh still not know everything sorry yeah and i think we have some harlequin bass in front of us we yeah have two of them yes so these are ones we also don't often see wow that was very quick the way it darted just then did you see that <laughs> no what just happened oh it just moved extremely quickly it went from one spot to another almost like it teleported <laughs> they're really beautiful fish these ones yeah very intricate markings we can see there and they are a sea bass Yes, the sea bass is a huge group of fish. It contains over 150 different ones. And it looks like this porgy is getting cleaned a meal. I'm desperate to show you guys the porgy. So we're gonna approach slowly and see if we can get it. He looks like he's having a good old clean. Cool, I'll get that ID book out. And just while we're going over to it, uh, <laughs> it looks like it's swimming off again, is it? <laughs> and no, they can hear us. <laughs> Um, but uh, Marcy and your mum both want an air check, please, Lauren. Oh, I'm on 80 bar. So that's 80 bar. So normally we end the dive at 50 bar. So we still have lots of time left. And I'm pretty shallow, so we're just going to go round and round the top of this tabletop. 
and see what other fish we can see. Yeah, this porgy's just not having any of it. I really don't need to show you guys. But it seems to be really shy. So I'll keep my eye on where he is. But for now, we're going to explore this area. Oh, the chumps are back. Uh, yes. So we did actually have Spess asking, do we get chubs here? And yes, we do. They're right here. There you go. Now, I was told by the captain of our boat today that these are definitely the Bermuda ones. But Pat mentioned they could be the brassy ones. So I'm really not sure. They're both two very similar looking species of chubs. So it's definitely one or the other. Here, I've got the ID book out, so I'll um, I'll confirm that uh, if I can. They do look so similar. Oh, they are notoriously difficult. They're both got the exact same body shape, and they're both sober. Oh, this is an interesting one. Look at this. Oh, it just changed colour, I think. There was a time it was half dark blue and half light blue. But he's just changed again. A lot of these fish can lighten and darken their skin depending on their environment. Another great thing that makes them complicated. So, now our Captain Steve was right, so it is the Bermuda or the Grey Chub. Yeah, I thought it might have been. So, these ones are the Bermuda Chubs. I think they're the most common ones here in Grand Cayman. So it looks like we got a yellow-tailed damselfish here it getting is, cleaned. And this one's quite big. It's got a small little Spanish hogfish cleaning it. I honestly think this is the first time I've seen a Spanish hogfish as a cleaner. Yeah, so the juveniles do tend to like to give a clean and I suppose this is because as they, when they are smaller, they don't really have the capacity, so they may as well just let the food come to them and eat it off the skin. There's a lot of cleaning going on in this week. It's like mini car washes all over the place. So just to just to clarify, Spaz, that was a yellow-tailed damselfish that we saw. Yes, we have pointed out these a few times, but they're just glorious fish. They're very, very dark in the body, and then all of a sudden, they have this bright yellow tail. Oh, we have a little birdfish. Oh, cute. How lovely. It's hiding out among the Gorgonians. It's very small. I actually think it could just be a juvenile or at least an adolescent. And this is a burrfish, which is a type of porcupine fish. But I think they might call this the balloon fish here. And if Emil is able to get you a good shot of the eye, you will see the whole galaxy inside of it. They have one of the most beautiful eyes I have ever seen. Let me know if you get a good glimpse of that. Yeah, this is incredible. It looks like some sort of gemstone. <laughs> yes. Oh, it's lovely. And yeah, this is definitely quite a young one. Maybe not a juvenile juvenile. And it's trying to hide out amongst the Gorgonians, but it's not quite working. So this is a type of porcupine fish. They just call it the burrfish here. So you can see the spines line against the body because they will do exactly what the others do. They're able to rapidly pump in water into their stomachs and inflate like a balloon. And then doing that, the spines against the body will become erect. So it will be like a giant well, spiky balloon, if you like. And this is the ultimate defense against predators. So the minute they sense danger coming, they just rapidly inflate, it really doesn't take long, and then they become almost indigestible. So the predator will think twice about eating them. And in my previous career, I did encounter 
a dead adult female le uh, lemon shark on the beach. It was a very upsetting sighting, but we were asked to remove her. And when we got closer, we realised she has a huge inflated porcupine fish wedged in her mouth, which has effectively caused her to drown, if you like, because she wasn't able to pump water over her gills. She wasn't able to get oxygen because this porcupine fish had blocked that. So unfortunately, these two beautiful creatures ended up dying. So it does show you how effective the fish inflation really is. Yes. Yeah, so cute. <laughs> So we know that there's a lot of our relationships in the ocean where, you know, both may benefit from the interaction or one will benefit and one will negatively be affected. But for them both to be negatively affected, I don't think I've ever heard of that relationship. Yeah, it was, it was such a rare sighting and it was such a sad moment for me because they're both glorious animals and the shark obviously made a wrong decision, if you like and chosen the wrong fish and the porcupine fish to try to defend itself. So what's interesting about these fish is that they have actually chosen to self-defense mechanism over other abilities in order to evolve. So the porcupine fish are really not good swimmers. They're very cumbersome, they're very awkward, if you like, and they sort of struggle to go really fast. Which you may think, oh, well, that's not a good idea because then they can be caught. But that is where their self-defense comes in. So they've kind of evolved these mechanisms to replace the fact that they're not good swimmers. So not only do they inflate and they have spiky spines, their flesh also contains really high levels of a special toxin called tetrodotoxin, which is extremely potent and is said to be 1,200 times more potent than cyanide. So they're armed with all these defenses. So if I was a shark, I definitely wouldn't want to eat a porcupine fish. No, I don't think there's many that would be wanting to eat them. So Lauren, uh, we have Phil and Luigi both on the Paddy YouTube page asking for a temperature and a depth check. Okay. Well, I can confirm that I'm, it's still at 8 metres. My watch tells me all this information. The, the tabletop that we're on is all 8 metres, so I haven't really changed. And let me just get the temperature for you. It is, in fact, 28 degrees Celsius. So I think that's 82 degrees Fahrenheit. Yes, you are right. So it's nice and warm down here, and I've got my wetsuit on. <laughs> Have we lost the little birdfish? Where did he go? Oh, he's here. So a lot of people wonder, uh, there is a sort of theory going around that these animals can die if they inflate too much. So that is not correct, they won't die, but it takes them a long time to deflate. They have a lot of trouble sort of getting rid of the excess water and it takes them 5.6 hours for their metabolism to get back to normal. So a tired fish is a vulnerable fish, so effectively they can definitely get eaten up by big sharks on the deflation stage. So it doesn't kill them, but it definitely isn't good for them. And uh, Richard, uh, so for our beard, I know you did join in late, but we're not actually at Casuarina Point today. We are out on a boat at a site called Fish Reef towards the northwestern side. Yes, a little change from Casuarina Point today. So we don't know these reefs as well, so it's sort of an exploration for us as well as it is for you. Now, we were going to try and get that corgi for you one more time, but it's, it's off. I think it's a little bit too shy. So we will be wrapping up the dive shortly, not now. So if you do have any questions, please 
please feel free to ask them. And I hope you enjoyed the first dive of Shark Day. Uh, yeah, so Spaz is asking about sharks and wants to know whether we get lemon sharks in the mangroves here. I don't believe we do here. In Maldives, we had a huge lemon shark population, but here in the Grand Cayman, I don't believe so. We do have a lot of mangroves around, and actually, the little house where we live has mangroves to the back garden, and there is a lot of evidence that shows the bull sharks coming into the mangroves to sort of have their babies, so <laughs> not sure how I feel about that. But yeah, lemon sharks, I don't believe so. And just going back to that uh, that bird fish we saw, Proud Cat Mama has a good question. She wants to know, is it true that once they're fully inflated, they lose all of their maneuverability? <laughs> Pretty much. They can still move their fins. So especially the pectoral fins, which are these ones at the side. This is me and my pectoral fin. These are the ones that will sort of propel them up. They don't lose all maneuverability, but it's very difficult for them to move when they're fully inflated. Their skin stretches up to 40% until it becomes a really tight sphere. And no Bernard, unfortunately we do not get great whites here. I I got them a lot back in my hometown, but that was back in the colder, temperate waters. Yeah, unfortunately. It's another animal for my bucket list there. So just a reminder to everyone that today is World Shark Awareness Day. So we are trying to spread the good lovin' about these beautiful creatures and try to reverse a bit of the bad rap that they have got. Actually, Pat, that's a really good point. Maybe we should sort of wrap up the dive talking about sharks. Even though we're not seeing them, they are present in the area and we need them in the ocean. It is a critical point for sharks now. Unfortunately, there was a Spielberg movie called Jaws, which did a lot of damage to what people think about sharks. But at the end of the day, we need them in our oceans. They are the apex predators. They do control ecosystems from top to down. They do get rid of the weak and the sick fish. And they do so much more. So it is critical now that we keep the shark populations healthy. Although they might be a little intimidating for us because they're smart and they're so good at what they do. And we don't really understand them, I guess. We are automatically scared of them. But whether we're scared or not, we need to keep them in our ocean. And today is all about them. They have their own day in the calendar. So at least today we can celebrate them a little bit. And do we have time for one final shark question? Absolutely. So Spess wants to know, he heard that they are enjoyed in soup in some places, shark fin soup, which is really bad. But he wants to know what other threats there are to sharks. What was the question? Can you repeat it, sorry? Yeah, so he, he said that he knows that they are used for shark fin soup in some places, but also wants to know what other threats we have we are to sharks. Yeah, so obviously, just to sort of expand on that, the biggest threat at the minute is sharks being killed for the shark fin soup, like Pat just mentioned. So it's only such a small part of the shark, just their fin, that is taken and used in an Asian delicacy as a soup. There is also other threats, and one of those threats is the fact that we are scared of them. So... A lot of people just kill them because they're scared of them. And also the fact that they can get stuck in our fishing gear by accident. So a lot of sharks get pulled up when they're not being meant to. Their skin is also used to make boots. It's 
a very specialized skin and it's very leathery and it can be used to make special leathery boots. There's also a traditional Chinese medicine where they believe that different parts of shards are good for us, especially their cartilage. So there's so many parts of the shark that can be used and these all accumulate to the threats. Lastly, shark's liver. It's full of oils. I did mention that earlier. And a lot of people back in the day used to kill the shark just for the oil so that they can paint the boats. So many threats, but at the end of the day, we need to start conserving them. So I am at 50 bar now, and that is where we end the dives here. So I just wanted to say thank you for joining us on this fantastic dive. It was really fishy, and it was really fun. Thank you, Emil, and thank you, Pat. As always, I'll be on the surface with you very soon. So please join us again at 11 a.m. We will be doing another boat dive somewhere special, and Pat will be with you underwater. So until then, see you soon. Yeah, looking forward to diving with you all in a few hours. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Emil. And thank you, our Dive Life family.